What does it take to succeed in life? From being discovered in a body bag alive in Vietnam by an alert medic to achieving national recognition by two United States presidents, our guest today, Urban Myaris, through his genuine enthusiastic zest for life, motivates and inspires us to attain success by giving something back to society. Welcome to Pace TV, Urban. Well, thank you, Jack. It's a pleasure to be with you. The first thing I have to ask you, because this body bag mm. is something that you don't you don't think of or discuss <laughs> too regularly. Tell me, tell me about that body that body bag in Vietnam. Well, it's uh, it probably happens more than people expect. I recently talked with uh, a soldier who just came back from Iraq, who too was in a body bag before they found him alive. And when you're in a battlefield situation and something happens, uh, the first duty of those who are in the back to take care of the wounded and the dead is to get them out of the area. Mm -hmm. So throwing them into a body bag, uh, especially if there's no immediate uh, recognition of life, uh, is critical. Well, uh, also I'd like to touch on the two presidents, the award that you received. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, that, That's <laughs> quite an honor uh, to be in the White House and especially when you have lunch with the presidents of the United States. Uh, Fortunately, with uh, George W. Bush, uh, twice uh, uh, met with him in 1991 uh, through a national honor I received from the Small Business Administration. And then in 1992, uh, I was uh, honored to receive the Presidential Point of Light, which is uh, a bit different than the Thousand Points of Light, which most people know about. Mm -hmm. And then later on in 1995, uh, President Clinton uh, asked me to be his representative at the White House Conference on Small Business. Mm -hmm. So it's quite an honor. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly think so, and, and probably muchly well deserved. Uh, now, here you, you're out of Vietnam, right? And now uh, our country certainly did a very, very bad number on of those people who participated, our soldiers in Vietnam. And how do you, you find yourself at that particular point in your life, coming out of Vietnam, and where are you now? Well, it's rough. Uh, 20 years of age, disabled. The doctors at the Veterans Administration uh, said that I had at best 20 years left of productive life if I even lived that long. And after almost six months of being at Valley Forge uh, Hospital in Pennsylvania, uh, I was discharged, uh, discharged from the hospital, stayed at home, and then a few weeks later got my discharge in the mail. You know, and welcome that, home, vet. Uh -huh. And fortunately, I had a friend who got me a job working in New York City and Wall Street, where I lived at the time, and worked there. And it wasn't long before uh, they found out I was a Vietnam veteran and fired me. And fired you. Because I was a Vietnam veteran, or as they said, a baby-killing Vietnam veteran. And that's when my business career started, because mm -hmm. my wife was pregnant. Uh, we had to, I had a, a family to support. I didn't know I could receive all these benefits. No one told me about it, probably if I, knew about all I was entitled to, I wouldn't be here. Mm. So with a neighbor who was also unemployed, we started a business. Is that and that was 40 years ago. I see. But prior to that, you did you have any work prior to that before you selected self-employment? Well, I had, uh, I had been sort of self-employed prior to that. Uh, growing up in New York on the streets, uh, constantly selling goods was uh, a way of life or survival at the time. Did you, uh, did you have any barriers that you encountered uh, being self-employed? Well, most definitely, and that, that's where what's led me to today. Back then, uh, someone with a disability mm -hmm. was not, uh, th there was no way to teach them or help them on how to start or run a business because we had to compete in the able-bodied world. Mm -hmm. And it took five businesses before I realized how to operate a business as someone with a disability. So is this the reason why you organized this businesses to help veterans and so on? But pretty much so. I was just so frustrated. I, I was angry and I said, one of these days I'm going to help others, but I had to prove first how it could be done. Mm -hmm. And it took a number of years before that opportunity came. Well, what issues do severely disabled veterans face? Well, first of all, with the disability, uh, the business world is able-bodied and we have to compete on their level. And when you have a disability, there's a separation between you and everybody else. If you take the profile of the ideal person with the, in business today, it's not a person with a disability. Uh, just like women in business see a separation. So with the disability, that gap of separation is even wider. 
So we have to learn how to close that gap as a business owner so we could compete on the same level. We're not even recognized as disadvantaged by the mm -hmm. federal government in business mm -hmm. having a disability, irregardless of how severe it is. So, so, so that's, that's the main really? problem. So, so what are the disadvantages of the disabled in business? Well, one is uh, most of the time we don't come from the financial resources that others in business do. We don't have jobs because of our disability. We might have poor credit or no credit at all. Uh, we're living, you know, based on public assistance in many cases. So we can't start with the normal traditional mode that lenders and others expect us to start in. Mm. Uh, how many disabled veterans have you helped uh, uh, up until this present time? Is there a, a number there you could relate to that or give me a broad idea? Well, our database that? shows 24,000. Yeah. You know, how many I've helped, it, it's, it's, a little, it's a little strange because mm -hmm. sometimes I'll have a vet call me up and say, how do I do this? And I just give them a suggestion over the phone and they go gangbusters. Mm -hmm. And then other times I'll get someone that calls and we work with them, a lot of time, energy, phone calls, meetings. Mm -hmm and they never do anything. What, what, what successes are you proud of? Well, the success I think I'm most proud of are those that really change their life and find the value of going back to work. Mm -hmm. uh, work, regardless of how much you get paid, is part of our culture, it's part of giving back to the community. And when you don't work, to me, you're taking from the community. So working is a form of giving back. Even if you volunteer, that's a form of work. Mm -hmm. So you have to give something back to the community. Community. Just because you're a disabled vet and you've served, maybe combat disabled, doesn't mean your life's over and you can now start taking. Mm -hmm. I mean, our, our responsibility is, as veterans or as citizens of the United States is to constantly give back mm -hmm. in some form. And to me, works the best way. Well, how do you handle the disabled veteran who has no desire, or is not aggressive, and chooses to uh, work on his pension instead of making his own personal contribution in society. How do you handle, how do you stimulate these, uh, a veteran of that type who's, who's a layback guy and just wants to receive rather than give? A great question, Jack, and I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think anybody does. You know, we, we all have different personalities based on our background, our culture, or what we went through in life. And sometimes it's it delayed. Sometimes today they might not feel like they want to give back anything, but things change. Uh, how I try to motivate them, if they want to improve their health, enjoy life more, uh, just have better relationships, mm -hmm. uh, just, just take the zest of life out. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to do something, and sitting back is not going to do it for mm -hmm. them. Uh, are you are familiar with Dr. McFarland? And re 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 what, mm -hmm. is, what is your relationship with him? You know, Dr. Fred McFarland and I go back uh, about 15 years. You know, we run parallel courses. Uh -huh. Him being an educator at San Diego State uh, University uh, Interwork Institute, they deal with teaching mostly professionals how to become voc rehab counselors and work for the Veterans Administration as well as uh, other government agencies. And I work parallel. I work with the consumers who these voc rehab counselors work with. Mm -hmm. And now working with Fred, uh, over these uh, last 15 years, it's opened up a whole world where I could educate voc rehab counselors on how people with disabilities can be successful mm -hmm. in self-employment. Right. Uh, I'd like to take a few moments now and uh, listen to what uh, Mr. Mc uh, Dr. McFarlane has to say. Great. My experiences working with Urban Myeris are at about three different dimensions. First, as an individual who has been a private business person who has been extremely successful in a number of avenues uh, over his entire career. A second aspect has been his experience in the military as, as a veteran uh, and as a strong and forceful advocate for veterans becoming fully reintegrated in the community, especially veterans with disabilities. The third area was, is as a sportsman. And when I, when I look at Urban from that perspective, he has been able to integrate all of those other aspects. He engages veterans with disabilities in his sports activities. He engages individuals with disabilities. And then he's been able to demonstrate it himself, both from skiing, as well as his Challenged America activities, uh, as well as his 
passion for making sure that every individual has all of the chances possible in their lives. Over the last few years, and by the way, my relationship with Urban goes back probably close to 15 years. Over the last few years, he's become increasingly committed and passionate about working with veterans, especially veterans with significant disabilities, either service-connected or disabilities after uh, they've left the service. Uh, he brings his, his own experiences as both a veteran, but also as a person with a disability to the table. And, and as I've watched him work with individuals, with veterans, he really engenders an amazing amount of compassion for people, uh, and that comes across. But he also ties it with realism. Uh, Urban, uh, Urban doesn't sugarcoat things very well. Uh, he, he's very straightforward in his interactions, and his advice and guidance is always, at least as I've observed it, very accurate and very powerful. As I've talked to Urban over the last four or five years, one of the, the areas that he's begun to explore, and I would fully support, is he needs to, to write his story. He needs to get his story out for a number of reasons. First, it's a pretty phenomenal story. Second, we all need role models and we all need people to look up to. Urban's somebody that fills that role. And finally, he really does have a real good understanding of what it takes for a person to succeed with all levels of adversity. He can speak from it from a personal and passionate standpoint, as well as a lifetime of experiences helping individuals. For me, he's the ultimate professional. Urban, the question I'd like to ask you now does the government or the military offer any financial help in any manner, shape, or form? Actually, no, none whatsoever. We're basically an uh, all-volunteer organization, have been since 1985, and we have five programs that we support and sponsor. Most of our funding comes from the general public uh, through donations and then when I do presentations or speaking fees. But uh, we're probably self-sufficient, it'd be nice, uh, the amount of work we have, would uh, we could definitely hire, we could put 10 to 15 people to work right away. And funding uh, for us as well as all charities is uh, a challenge today. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess everybody's reaching out for it, but I think the, the disabled should be first in line anyway, in my, in my opinion. Uh, I know that you are a great uh, boatsman, and uh, could you elaborate a little bit of what you've done in yeah. the past and what you're doing today? Well, you know, when you have a disability, an example, I'm total blind, I'm hearing impaired, post-traumatic stress, uh, walking paraplegic, uh, diabetes, a number of other medical conditions, rehabilitation never ends. And studies have shown, and it's demonstrated time and time again, those with disabilities who do best in the workplace financially uh, and are more active tend to have an active recreational or athletic lifestyle. So sailing, uh, it tends to be a, a sport I love. I did it as a child. And one of our programs is Challenged America, where we take people with disabilities, or disabled vets, put them in a sailboat and show them how to sail and get that new life experience. And then hopefully when they get out of the boat, we could talk to them about going back into business or going to work or back to school. Mm -hmm. I know recently you acquired a new boat. Could you wow. tell us a little, a little about that? Uh, what a shock this was. Uh, a gentleman, uh, husband and wife in San Diego, Brian and Suzanne Hull, uh, had a very famous racing sailboat. Uh, practically new, they kept it as a gem. And they decided to donate their boat to us for our use. And we, we just received the boat a few weeks ago. We have to modify it for the disabled, including putting an elevator mm -hmm. so those in wheelchairs or those who have no legs could get down below. And uh, we're going to get it going and hopefully race it to Hawaii next year. Do you encounter, I know you had one, you had one major experience on your previous boat, maybe more. 
did you have any difficulty? What, what did you experience at the time for the people who were disabled, of course, and how do they handle themselves on that particular trip? Well, the, the program Challenged America actually started in 1978 by disabled veterans mm -hmm. who didn't have access to sailing, so they went out and bought a boat. And uh, myself being one of the founders of Challenged America, it became a program of the charity as rehabilitation. And the, the challenges we are quite extensive because when we race, we race in mainstream sailing. Uh, we could be at the starting line with the top skippers in the world, America's Cup skippers. And we have to compete on their level and we do quite well. Uh, so we have to modify the boat and we focus on teamwork. Mm -hmm. There's no rock stars or super sailors on our boats. Everybody has a teammate that works a specific crew position together as a team. Well, that's the point that I was trying to uh, make about what is the training? How do you train the disabled with their, all their disabilities and to make them so cohesive that you have this wonderful team that uh, applies to how you're doing that race? How, yeah, it's, how, it's, what's the training? Yeah, it's, how, how's that done? Yeah, it's quite a challenge. You know, boats aren't designed for the disabled. That's, that's and we sure. have to adapt to that, just like life. We have mm -hmm. to adapt uh, to life. Uh, and it takes a lot of time on the water mainly and a lot of experimenting. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know what will work and what will work for one person who's blind might not work for another person with the same visual uh, limitations. Mm -hmm. Someone who's a paraplegic or quadriplegic might have completely different needs than someone else who's a paraplegic or quadriplegic. Uh, disabilities don't come in a square box. Uh -huh. what, what ages are these people? Does, does age make a difference? Generally, no. Uh, we say we take youngsters from five years of age to 95 years of age, mm -hmm. and we've had that, uh, that range of disabilities and ages uh, in the program. Again, we customize for each individual and what they want to get out of the sailing experience. Mm -hmm. Now, these, these sailors that you use, these ones that train, do you use a new crew, the new ship that you have, or boat that you have now? Are you going to use the same people, or now you're going to train new people to uh, get into that positions? Well, one of the responsibilities we have of anybody who goes into the program, they have an obligation to the next generation, whether it's kids with disabilities or someone that's replacing them on the boat or even in business. Succession is so critical. Uh, in business today and you know let's face it us with disabilities our life expectancy in most cases is not as long as someone without a disability uh, supposedly uh, things are changing now with medical science so succession is so critical for us and that's why we do kids programs and all uh, we have to set up as a role model or a mentor to the next generation regardless of the age mm -hmm. now where do you keep this boat uh, that, that you're going to use? And have you had any experiences with the people who own the uh, areas of storage and so on? Have you encountered any discrimination or anything of that nature because of the crew that you use and, and the things that you're trying to do? Well, first of all, sailing is the only sporting venue that I know of that the disabled are equal to everybody else. You're not discriminated against in the sail sailboat racing. When you're at the starting line, you're like everybody else, and if you qualify with a, a boat that's good seamanship and, and the crew is able to take care of a boat uh, and themselves, uh, anybody could win a race. Mm -hmm. Wind, tide, and experience dictate that. And with the boat and the marinas and all, there have been a problem. San Diego's extremely expensive. And of course, us being a charity, it's expensive for us to keep the boats and it's, it's been difficult trying to find affordable space. Unfortunately, those spaces that are more affordable are not accessible mm -hmm. uh, for a number of reasons. You gotta look at it. We serve people with the most extreme catastrophic of disabilities. People who are in ventilators, people who have no body movement whatsoever are sailing sailboats in San Diego today, as well as going into business and doing other things in the workplace. So. Uh, we, we put a test on everybody. Now, we were discussing before about skiing, and uh, could you just, uh, now I just can't possibly uh, understand how that is accomplished, and uh, yeah. could you sort of elaborate on that a little? Well, in uh, 1987, the very first Department of Veterans Affairs Winter Sports Clinic was in Grand Junction, Colorado, and they asked me to go skiing as part of my blind rehabilitation. And I said, no, I don't <laughs> like skiing. I don't like the cold. I have never been on a pair of skis. 
and they wanted me to go down a mountain, not able to see, not able to feel my feet, and knowing that there were trees around. It wasn't going to happen. <laughs> well, I went in 1987 due to a bunch of friends of mine uh, who were also disabled vets Vietnam, and we went there, and uh, I was right. I hated it. <laughs> but I got some value out of it when I saw people in worse condition, other vets that were much physically disabled, so much worse than I was, and they were having fun. So I went back the second year with my wife, and then they said I was pretty good. <laughs> and I started racing in 1989 and didn't do well, but I have that type A plus personality. <laughs> so I trained and trained. In 1990 and 91, I was U.S. ski champ, Alpine ski champ, downhill, uh, total blind, and ranked as the world's fastest total blind skier, uh, going at speeds at over 60 miles an hour with tape goggles and the whole, uh, the, the, the whole requirements the whole of being on the Olympic team, yes. Mm -hmm. So now, how is this accomplished? Uh, uh, you, you're not, certainly not going down by yourself because you certainly cannot mm -hmm. see whatever the obstacles are and so on. G give us an idea how you do that. Well, first of all, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, you've got someone with a helmet on, it's got goggles on, snow goggles, with duct tape across it. Because when you're total blind, they want to make sure there's no peaking. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have, uh, I have a microphone built in my helmet. I've got a bib that says blind skier, or as I say, target. Mm -hmm. I wear leg braces because I don't feel my legs. I break my legs all the time. Mm -hmm. And I've skied all day on a broken leg and didn't even know it. And then I have outriggers, which are Canadian crutches. Those are the crutches that can wrap around your wrist and you mm -hmm. grab. With the first 15 inches of the ski cut off on the end of each one of those crutches, plus the regular size skis, on my feet, so I'm what's called a four tracker. Mm -hmm. And I go down that way with a very experienced skier, a guide, who skis alongside or behind me, yelling, left turn, right turn, go, 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 stop, you know, <laughs> things like that. And uh, well, that's right. how it goes. And in 1991, I retired uh, because uh, I was getting too old and <laughs> not recovering. and. I still don't like skiing. I, I just had to be good at it. So I melted the snow and went sailing. And you had you you uh, you achieved many awards on that as well, haven't you? I have. I have been very fortunate in that area. You know, it's just something you you stay around long enough, you win an award for something. And mm -hmm. it seems now, 40 years of of with all the disabilities, and being active in the the business yeah. world and in life, uh, you just the recognition just comes. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of any other competitive sports that the disabled participate in? Oh my goodness, it's everything. Uh, they either s separate themselves, either they'll compete against other people with disabilities, or they'll go into uh, sporting events, track and field, swimming and all, against those without disabilities. And there's quite a controversy going on right now due to prosthetic limbs where uh, athletes, elite athletes with disabilities, having artificial legs as an example, are on the verge of breaking world records by the able-bodied. What do you, <coughs> what do you uh, look forward to on the future disabled? We, you know, we've had many wars, as you know, and we have certainly uh, these people have been treated on these spots, so their lives have been saved, but they b have brought in some huge disabilities. How do you look at the future of this disabled? Well, it, it's changing dramatically. Technology, medical health care, uh, and everything related to the disabled, just over the last five or ten years, we're doing so many things now that uh, today, you know, years ago wouldn't even be considered. So what's going to happen is that the public is our, still our biggest battle. People have an attitude of what we can and can't do when they hear about myself skiing down a mountain at 60 miles an hour mm -hmm. or crossing an ocean and sailing to, to Hawaii from Los Angeles in the Transpac. Uh, first time ever done. We've done it twice already and hope to do it again with an all-disabled crew, quadriplegics, paraplegics, and blind, and racing and doing quite well. Uh, the public has to realize that we're not to be patronized. Give us a chance. We'll achieve it. Uh, look at us for employment. When you see us in business, we might be a darn good business person you want to do business with. And as a consumer, if you see somebody that's in business with a disability, don't try to discount it. They probably have good products. We have to work harder just to prove ourselves mm -hmm. in life. So the disabled, it, it's come a long way. Uh, attitudes still have to be changed. Uh, the laws are a mixed blessing. Uh, they're, they're really not uh, helping us in some areas and helping us in others. Uh, it, it's 
something that's going to go even farther and farther. And just remember, we have a saying in the disabled community, live long enough, you'll be one of us. Uh -huh. So when you look at us sympathetically, uh, look in the mirror, it might be you too one day. Well, you know, you tick off all these things that, uh, uh, that you're so capable of doing as a disabled. Those of us who have all our facilities, our limbs, our eyes, and so on, we hesitate much more so than you have had those disabilities. So it's really something that, uh, that is mind-boggling to yeah. me. But well, uh, well, well, you know, Jack, the, the thing is, you know, I have a disability. Everybody else that thinks that way has a handicap. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it's two different worlds. Mm -hmm. And maybe with my disabilities has given me the motive to do everything I have done. And I probably would not have done it at all if I didn't have uh, the disability going back to Vietnam. You know, my wife always says that there is a gift in adversity. And uh, actually, when you think about it, there is a gift in adversity. And even though you're you don't have all the opportunities of having everything together, nevertheless you're doing. But you know, I just want to thank you so much, Urban, for participating in, in this program and uh, giving us a little bit of your history and giving us about your successes. Uh, to me, it's mind boggling that you are capable to achieve the successes that you do with, with, with the handicaps you have. And for those of us who have no handicap, we are about 50 yards behind you all the time. So you've risen to these occasions and uh, uh, n I, can't possibly, I can't possibly thank you so much for sharing and letting our people in on your life. And we have more, much more respect for you. And we are certainly are aware of, uh, of the intricacies of, of what you're doing and how you're doing it. It, it has a lot of courage, a lot of faith, and, uh, and I think uh, you have the strength and capacity to do, to do what you do, do what you do.